Thank you very much, uh, Tariq. And uh, since I joined uh, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory quite recently, I'll just give a short introduction of what we are intending to do in uh, what we call an initiative, which is a multi-year, multi-million uh, investment in building new capabilities. Uh, and then I will proceed to uh, tell some of the uh, work I did in my uh, previous uh, position uh, in, 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 the, in the smart grid uh, area. So I'll first give a, a, sh a very short introduction to the Control of Complex Systems Initiative at PNNL. And uh, then I will be uh, talking about the, the work I, I did in the past, uh, which was all motivated by uh, the high penetration of renewables in uh, Denmark, where I had uh, several positions, and uh, I'll tell uh, then I will shift gears and be more technical and talk about some of the specific solutions that we uh, found that has to do with uh, aggregation and um, how you use aggregation to characterize uh, different classes of consumers. I'll specifically show you how we came up with algorithms that were later tested for aggregating uh, on-off uh, type of units. And uh, I will uh, shortly show how this was uh, done in, in, in practice. So um, the uh, Control of Complex Systems Initiative is, uh, as I mentioned, uh, one of the instruments that is used at the uh, National Labs for the Department of Energy uh, to build um, long-term uh, investments in order to create uh, capabilities for Department of Energy. So uh, most of the activities at uh, the National Labs are are funded directly, but by the burdening of uh, funded projects, uh, the labs can uh, make their own basic research initiatives, and and uh, and that's uh, the kind of activity that I'm leading for PNNL. So, uh, what we really want to do in this initiative is to uh, work under the slogan "Go uh, enabling the transition from from big data to big control." So. Uh, Big data is much about uh, analytics. Our ambition is to move from analytics to actually exploiting all of those data in, in real time. I think everyone here knows about the massive amount of data that is generated, uh, not least in recent years where we have uh, introduced uh, zillions of new types of uh, sensors that generate vast amounts of, of data that could not be stored more than a few days even on, on some of our larger uh, servers. So the idea of, uh, of using all of that data in a centralized fashion is uh, completely unrealistic. So uh, one of our main hypotheses is that we can activate this data and uh, use it for real-time uh, feedback on, on various uh, timescales uh, by uh, resorting to distributed uh, control schemes. So uh, the main theme of our activities will be in the area of uh, distributed control of uh, large-scale systems. And the, the main two points of emphasis in the activities will be one, scalability, and two, deployability. So there are many solutions around for distributed uh, control systems that can handle uh, large systems uh, as they are defined in the control community, which are typically still only a few hundred or thousands of, of systems. But in, for instance, in the power grid, we need to uh, address millions or perhaps even billions of, of units. So we want to achieve uh, true scalability in, in that respect. Uh, the other notion is uh, deployability that um, we don't simply substitute a trillion dollar infrastructure like the power grid uh, overnight. We need to have uh, solutions that can actually be implemented in a modular, incremental fashion. But first and last, we want to provide a mathematical framework 
that gives uh, guarantee properties of the uh, control of the power grid which of course in, in the legacy grid was, was never there that was not how the grid was designed to be honest we uh, don't really know why it's working so well as it is uh, so we have these uh, millions of devices large amounts of data these assets are very uh, difficult uh, to coordinate and if if we are completely uh, honest most of, of the power grid is controlled by control theory that was developed more than 70 years ago if we look at the uh, fiscal side we had a, we have a lot of uh, edge computing that is uh, emerging and that capability should be exploited if we want really to achieve the full potential I said perhaps as another option we have uh, pervasive uh, cloud computing becoming available on the challenge side uh, we see that distributing the uh, power grid control will give us a number of security issues and when we design a new control system we, we need to take security into account as we build this uh, new control system and uh, what we're going to do in in practice is that uh, we have organized the initiative in uh, three focus areas one which is uh, developing of new distributed uh, large-scale deployable uh, control theory we'll take these into tools that make them uh, practical and we're going to show proof of concept for, for the theory and for the tools in terms of uh, test beds that will be uh, developed uh, at Pacific Northwest National Lab. Perhaps some of you know that we have already a, a number of uh, very large scale uh, facilities. We will uh, uh, expand those uh, to be able to show distributed large scale control for uh, at a very large uh, scale. This will be a, a hybrid uh, model where part of it will be uh, uh, physical uh, units in our lab where we show that our algorithms will actually work for these specific uh, devices combined with uh, simulation for uh, a very large number of, of nodes using our high performance computing uh, facilities this of course has to be in uh, real time in order to be uh, integrated with the physical uh, units and uh, on top of that we want to federate because uh, in the US there's a, a lot of very exciting test beds around at other national labs, at universities, at utilities and uh, private, other private uh, companies and we want to be able to federate these to encompass diversity in this fashion because many of these test beds have been built for very different objectives with very different capabilities so Part of the proof of concept is to show that we can federate all of these and achieve uh, some of the diversity of the uh, real grid, capture that by the test beds also. So let me tell you um, about some of the work I did in uh, my previous uh, positions. Uh, the, the background for, for much of this work was motivated by the fact that uh, this was work done in uh, Denmark that has perhaps as you know the uh, the world record in uh, wind power penetra penetration I don't have the 2013 numbers yet but in 2012 it was 35.3% uh, uh, measured in uh, energy so the capacity was even uh, higher but in terms of actual uh, electrical energy for that year uh, the uh, deployed power was 35.3 percent and uh, by 2020 this will reach uh, 50 percent this introduced of, of course uh, a lot of uh, intermittency on the Danish power grid and uh, thereby some uh, wonderful uh, com control challenges that we've been working with on, on various uh, aspects. So, uh, so how was this uh, possible? Actually we were also working at the other end of this 
clearly when you have uh, some intermittent sources, you, all, you need to have uh, other sources that can compensate for that. Uh, so what we did in for a, a very large number of years was to revisit the way that uh, the, 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 the base capacity in the Danish power grid were controlled. Uh, Denmark does not have uh, nuclear, so this is basically uh, fossil fired uh, power plants and um, uh, basically coal and, and gas. Uh, so what we did was to uh, to look at uh, the load following capabilities of the existing uh, power plants and we were extremely lucky that uh, just at that time uh, the largest uh, utility was taking a specific uh, block in a power plant off grid and the R&D group for that utility convinced management that they and we could do experiments with that block and try to build a new control system for the water steam cycle of that uh, specific uh, block. And uh, by doing so, uh, we, uh, we introduced a model-based controller, uh, two degrees of freedom LQ, and uh, we showed that for this specific uh, unit, we were able to increase the load following capability by more than 100%. And uh, I think, as you all know, uh, utilities are conservative businesses for good reasons. But uh, when, when management saw these numbers uh, that we were able to improve by more than 100%, they, they saw, well, this, this is, we, we, we need this in, in the face of the challenges that we are seeing with uh, wind power and other issues. Uh, we need to uh, we need to have solutions like this. So in the following uh, 15 years, this was implemented in uh, four of the seven uh, main power plants uh, in uh, Denmark. The the actuals uh, in so these 100% uh, that was uh, under uh, ideal conditions in in actual production it was uh, significant significantly smaller. Uh, the uh, for a number of consecutive years, the, the gain in load following capability was around uh, 30 percent in, in actual uh, production. But the good thing was that that was uh, quite enough to uh, accommodate the uh, penetration of uh, wind power that we had in, in the same uh, period. So the, the grid remained uh, stable and actually became uh, one of the most stable uh, grids in, in Europe. In fact, of the high, in, in, in spite of the high uh, wind power penetration, and I and I should say that uh, in the same period, the emissions uh, were uh, reduced uh, dramatically, and I I was kind of wondering in uh, what uh, Buck said yesterday about uh, Germany. Uh, he claimed that uh, Germany. Uh, Double their emissions in the period when they introduced uh, solar power. I, I I don't believe that's correct. I I looked it up yesterday evening, and uh, if you go to the European Commission and look under the uh, energy section, uh, you'll see that they have reports for uh, all the major uh, countries in Europe. And I he didn't mention which period and on whether it was a specific utility or a specific region. But if you look for Germany as as, as a uh, as a country in, in the period where they s started introducing uh, solar power, they went from uh, 307 uh, megatons a year to 287 megatons a year, so uh, definitely a reduction. This was, this was uh, 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 over the uh, um, financial crisis, so, so that should be kept in mind that it, it would probably have decreased a little bit anyway, and it was not a, a 20% uh, 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 decrease, but it was definitely not a doubling, it was a, it was a decrease. So I, 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 I don't think that's correct, but that's an aside. And I'm not especially in, in the business of defending Germany's uh, uh, power system, but anyway, uh, Denmark reduced uh, emissions significantly for, for two reasons, introduction of uh, wind power uh, and as a side effect of the increase of load following capability that we did by redesigning the uh, controller of the water steam cycle in the power plants, we were able to reduce emissions at the same time. 
by having better control of the process. It's, it seems logical, but it's not trivial because the, the transients be became much uh, higher and you'd expect that uh, if you have much more transients, you'd also have higher emissions. But uh, that's actually not true. If, if, you, if you do the control properly, you can reduce emissions and increase uh, transients. At the same time, the overall structure due to uh, European policy uh, regulation uh, also changed dramatically. So uh, these uh, few dots represent uh, about 90% of the uh, electrical power production in Denmark in uh, 1990. And these uh, 300 dots represent, represent the same 90% uh, in uh, 2012. And this means that the uh, central dispatch uh, capability reduced uh, dramatically, which was one of the reasons why uh, the load following capability needed to be improved uh, dramatically. This also means that reaching the goals in 2020 of uh, having 50% and uh, there are further goals uh, further ahead with an even higher uh, penetration of renewables means that we, we need to uh, do more if we don't want to see more situations uh, like this. This is an event in uh, 2006, uh, when uh, there was a major uh, north-south oscillation uh, on the uh, European uh, main European connection, uh, and um, the, the, the picture shows a specific instance uh, of the phase angle, uh, where you see uh, positive angles in the uh, in the northern part. This is uh, Denmark. This is northern uh, Germany, and you see uh, negative phase angles. Uh, uh, down here. And this specific event caused uh, 15 million uh, European citizens to have uh, outages, so a, a very significant uh, outage. The main reason for that was uh, a very large uh, wind power production uh, in, uh, in, nor in north of Europe. In uh, Denmark, Denmark is, is a small uh, country, but, uh, but uh, especially northern uh, Germany. Uh, and, uh, and, and that caused these oscillations. And, and life is not really fair because uh, the region that had this uh, 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 additional wind power, uh, they didn't really have uh, problems. All the outages uh, came in uh, parts of France, northern Spain, parts of Italy. So, uh, so, but, I, but I, I'm telling this because I, I think there's a reason for that, and and that reason is that uh, in in the in the countries where uh, wind power uh, production uh, was increased, also uh, solutions for stronger grids were uh, put in place. Uh, so, so although. Uh, these areas have much more intermittency. They also already had taken measures to uh, accommodate this. But uh, I'm sure the DC cables in the Scandinavia help as well. Oh yes, <laughs> uh, de 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 definitely. That's 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 part of the story. Uh, the transmission is is a luxury in uh, uh, in in, uh, in 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 Denmark, and it would have been. Uh, very difficult to do the same in in other uh, in other regions at, at least at the rate where we uh, where we did that so so that's definitely part of the story that's that's correct uh, however to to meet the uh, upcoming goals uh, uh, <coughs> since we are reducing the uh, fossil fire power plant uh, pr uh, production uh, it will, it will not be possible to, to meet those goals uh, simply by uh, increasing load falling capability but on the generation side uh, just as much. Uh, so we need uh, other handles and uh, one of these is to look into uh, things like uh, consumer flexibility and, and that's what I'm, I'm going to talk a bit about. Uh, so the idea is that uh, rather than building uh, expensive electrical storages, why not use the energy storages that we have already, especially thermal storages, so making those work as uh, virtual electrical storages by controlling uh, the time of conversion between electrical and thermal uh, energy. And these are, of course, as you know, commercial buildings, supermarkets, tiller systems, heat pumps, and, and, and so on. 
So basically what we can do is to urge or delay the power consumption for, for these systems. And uh, in this workshop we have mainly talked about uh, markets, uh, which would be part of the story about uh, indirect control, where the control is um, enabled by communicating uh, prices, negotiating at, at, uh, at markets. Um, and as I mentioned uh, yesterday, there are some issues on, on, uh, on that side. And uh, those issues are part of what we are uh, trying to resolve in the initiative, expanding the transactive uh, energy approach into something that uh, can actually be deployed as uh, uh, a, a multi-level uh, hierarchical uh, solution with guaranteed uh, stability issues. But uh, if there's, uh, there are more uh, ways to do it wrong than to do it right, and uh, it's, it's, it's highly uh, non-trivial, and it links, of course, to some of the uh, talks we heard this uh, morning. What I will mention in the, in the following minutes is about uh, direct control. So uh, I'll be assuming that there are contracts between uh, balance, and re balance responsible parties and uh, aggregators that have access to uh, putting references to specific uh, units where these units are guaranteed to, uh, to follow uh, rather accurately the power references. Of course, this can also be put in place by uh, by an auction system. But uh, at, but the essence here is that from the uh, uh, BRP point of view, it's going to look like uh, we have uh, references uh, rather than having a price signal. So this is part of the direct control scheme. So uh, if we try to uh, model this in a a little bit uh, uh, childish uh, manner. Uh, we could we could see a, a centralized control problem as having a, a main controller uh, that can has access to a number of uh, storages and and need to uh, decide on the use of these in order to uh, mitigate the effects of uh, production consumption mismatch. So. So everything else on the grid has uh, been uh, accumulated in, into this uh, one signal F load, which should be seen as uh, the instantaneous uh, mismatch between generation and consumption. And then the specific controller tries to, uh, to mitigate uh, that mismatch such that in the end the uh, power uh, balance is uh, minimized by controlling negative or positive uh, flows here. When I say negative flows, uh, when I say negative flows, that is relative to a baseline, uh, the conversion from electrical to thermal uh, would of course always be unidirectional, but if you do uh, this modeling around a, a baseline, you will have a symmetric uh, model where we, we can have a positive or negative uh, power flows. So uh, if, we, uh, if, if we model this, uh, we can a simplified model of these storages would simply be uh, kind of uh, uh, buckets, so integrators, buckets of uh, energy that are uh, limited from below and above in energy and similar in, in power, each can accept a maximal and a, and a minimal uh, power flow. And, um, then we could uh, take this model and uh, build an optimization problem uh, on, on top of that. So uh, minimize uh, an objective function that takes the mismatch into account, uh, as well as uh, external handles and uh, the, the rates at which we are uh, using these, which we also usually have to, to, to pay for, subject to uh, these uh, energy constraints and power constraints for each unit. And in, in principle, uh, uh, there exist control solutions to that kind of uh, problem, trying to distribute the uh, energy storage some time into the, the future. Model predictive control does this explicitly. Other control methods does, does it implicitly. Uh, but at the end, uh, every control algorithm t takes just that decision. How are we going to distribute our energy storage in, in, a, in the near future? And uh, 
unfortunately, uh, MPC and other algorithms tend to grow uh, computationally in a cubic fashion. So this is not something we can do for uh, millions or even billions of, of, uh, of units. So uh, clearly the uh, solution to this is to go to the realm of hierarchical control. So we, we are going to uh, aggregate units in, in one or several uh, le levels. Uh, and uh, then we aggregate the capacities and distribute decisions and disaggregate in order to make uh, specific uh, deployments. There's one uh, specific uh, challenge in, in this, uh, and uh, that is that if we uh, have units, we have to remember that the, the, the types of units that we have available are extremely uh, diverse. Uh, and one specific challenge is that if we have a, a small energy storage with a large power capacity, illustrated by this larger lid and smaller volume, and a large capacity in energy and a small capacity in power, you would kind of think, well, that would altogether give me a, a large energy capacity with a large power capacity. And, and that's not true, unfortunately. Because if, if, you, if you believe that, and you try to, to fill up the system at a high power rate, you will effectively be filling only this, and then you'll meet the, const the energy constraint of, of this one. So we need to take that into account and, and have a more subtle model of, of, uh, of the aggregated units. And uh, the specific approach that, that we came up with is, uh, is one that is based on uh, remodeling of the uh, uh, power uh, time series where we take a time series uh, and map it into a, a static map in a, in a higher dimension, in a dimension that matches the number of uh, samples that we want to design for in, in, the, in the future. So uh, if we look at, at a specific example, uh, we take the first sample and, and uh, there we have a maximal power we can employ and a minimal power we can uh, deploy and we map that to an interval in the first dimension. For the next sample, similarly we have uh, a maximal uh, power constraint uh, and a, a maximal power constraint and a minimal power constraint and we, have, we might have an, a maximal uh, energy constraint as well and uh, that's depicted here in the second dimension where we have the power constraints and the energy constraints as slopes. Uh, lines, and and we can go uh, further. So for the first, for, so for the third sample, we go into uh, three dimensions, and uh, get a, a figure like this again with um, planes uh, parallel to the uh, coordinate uh, systems for power constraints and uh, slope planes, uh, slope constraints for uh, energy constraints, but and. Uh, the slides wouldn't accommodate for more than three dimensions, so. Uh, but uh, you can do this, of course. Uh, you can build a model like this for any number of uh, dimensions, and what you will get is, uh, for every uh, type of unit, uh, a, a convex polytope. So when we aggregate, we are then faced with a number of uh, convex polytopes, and and the beauty of it is that. Uh, Con uh, although uh, units cannot be added in uh, power and energy, they can be added geometrically in uh, polytopes. Oh my goodness! Uh, and uh, by uh, applying uh, Minkowski sum. So if we have one unit, so this could be a residential uh, 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 facility with a, a geothermal heat pump and a, a larger one which could be a commercial uh, building. Uh, in, in two samples, they could be constrained uh, like this. Uh, then you can prove that the uh, aggregated unit, by combining these two, is uh, described by the Minkowski sum. If you don't remember it, it's easy to construct. You take uh, one of the polytopes and pu uh, put it on the vertex of uh, every vertex of the other polytope, and then the resulting contour has a convex hull, that is the uh, Minkowski sum. And uh, 
it turns out that this is an, a, an exact representation. So every interior point of the Minkowski, Minkowski sum can be realized by a combination of uh, powers uh, and entities for each of these two units and vice versa. Every, uh, every deployment by these two units corresponds to an interior point of the Minkowski sum. So this is an exact representation. And we have uh, used that, uh, built this into uh, an optimization. Here's a, a very small one where we have taken uh, 20 uh, different units randomly generated. So you see here are the uh, energy capacities. They are quite uh, uh, different and maximum and minimum power capacities that are also quite different. And uh, we deploy them in the sense that we make them available to the aggregator uh, one, one by one. So this is a 1,000 sample uh, simulation where the first one is uh, available throughout the simulation. The, one, the second one becomes available after 50 samples, the third one after 100 samples, and, and so forth. And perhaps you can see that the uh, activation of each one becomes smaller as we get more and more units available. And that's exactly what we are hoping for. This is an uh, algorithm where we are using uh, a sorting, we are using an optimization problem, but we have, uh, rather than using quadratic optimization, which is uh, uh, cubic, uh, sorry, qu quadratic, uh, we have uh, replaced that by a simple sorting algorithm that uh, achieves uh, almost the same uh, uh, objective function, but with a, uh, with a logarithmic uh, c complexity. So this is a load taken from uh, North Pole, the Scandinavian market, on a specific uh, day. Uh, this is the resulting uh, power mismatch for the algorithm, and perhaps you can see as uh, time proceeds and we get more and more units available, the mismatch becomes smaller and smaller, and after this point, there's no longer any mismatch, so we have we had just enough capacity to remove the uh, imbalance completely. And uh, perhaps you can see in this figure that uh, we have an upper bound for storage and a lower bound for storage. And after this, around this point, uh, the the actual deployment does no longer uh, reach the upper and lower bound, and that's where we are able to to make a complete uh, balancing. Of, of the grid. So uh, let me show you um, how we could use this to uh, aggregate uh, on-off units. So the idea was to uh, uh, have an aggregator that has access, access to a technical uh, virtual power plant that has a, a number of uh, storage devices uh, available. In uh, we uh, did a, a practical demonstration of this, where this uh, was used for uh, a residential application, with, uh, where we were able to control a number of uh, geothermal uh, heat pumps that acted as uh, used the thermal storages in, in these uh, buildings. And uh, we deliberately under, under modeled uh, the, uh, the, the systems in order to, to show that a, a very simple model uh, suffices to, to make the, the correct decisions that uh, activate the, the energy and achieves the balance. So, so we, for each uh, building we introduced a, a simple uh, uh, integrator model with, with some uh, leakage and uh, a, a binary decision variable that uh, could switch between uh, full power and, uh, and, and zero power. And uh, clearly each, each uh, building would be constrained by, uh, uh, by an upper bound, uh, collected in this vector x. Uh, further, we uh, consider it uh, runtime and, and downtime constraints because uh, uh, in, a, in a heat pump, uh, if you uh, if you cycle it uh, too frequently, it 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 uh, deteriorates the lifetime of the uh, heat pump. So uh, we introduced uh, constraints that once you turn it on, it needs to stay on for a time. Once you turn it off, it needs to stay off during some time. Uh, and we our baseline for this was uh, classical hysteresis control, which which is uh, how such systems are usually operated. And uh, if you look at the hysteresis control, I have no idea what happened here.
if you try to use um, uh, classical hysteresis control, you get this very uh, a, a very rocket uh, solution. So this was the uh, the baseline that we were trying to uh, compare. So uh, what we did was uh, uh, we created an algorithm that. Uh, could handle uh, portfolios with a very large number of devices uh, based on uh, sorting algorithms operating with very little knowledge uh, for device parameters, uh, so based on estimation and uh, handling devices that could autonomously switch states because we could only override to a certain extent because the systems could uh, were able to, were we, we had to make the system in such a way that they could still turn on and off if they reached the uh, physical limits. So uh, we made a very simple control scheme where at, uh, at the end we had just a, 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 an overall power reference which was what uh, was sold uh, on, a, on a spot market uh, in the Scandinavian uh, market. Compared that to the estimate of uh, actually consumed uh, power and uh, used a, so this is basically a, a scalar controller that gives a scalar uh, power control reference and then the uh, interesting part is how do you uh, disaggregate this into our portfolio of, of, of a very large number of uh, units and uh, the specific algorithm that we uh, that we did, uh, took the following approach. It uh, tried to maximize agility. So it, it, it always picks uh, the units. If, if, we, if you need to turn, turn off units, it's going to pick the units that are going to turn off anyway in a, in, in a short time. If it needs to turn on units, similarly, it picks units that would turn on anyway. By doing that, we, we maximize at every time instance our agility uh, to, to have the, 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 the maximum uh, uh, number of assets to sell in, in the next uh, period of time. And uh, here you see the uh, result. Uh, so there's, there's a black reference that you almost cannot discern from the, from the blue curve, which is the hourly uh, energy that we uh, obtained. Uh, whereas if you uh, compare with the uh, a controller based on hysteresis that does not take agility into account, uh, we get in a number of uh, instances where we have a, a very large uh, deviation. But with the agile control system, we are able actually able to get spot on. And uh, it, this, this is the uh, accumulated, this is uh, for, for uh, the um, uh, regulating power market in Scandinavia, which is a 60 minute market uh, cleared at the hour. So you need, it's, it's basically an energy uh, market for a one hour uh, energy. So, so the, here you see the energy and here you see the actual power. Uh, you, you do see some uh, oscillations here. They are not, uh, they are not very large and they, they, they can be handled, but, uh, and, and that's something you can discuss. This is due to the peculiarity of this market, so you're not penalized for doing that. Perhaps you want to change that, but that's, that's a, a, quite another discussion. And uh, I think I'm pretty much out of time. So, uh, so, you, so you saw that uh, aggregated, in an aggregated fashion, we were spot on with this. Uh, for this is a specific uh, example where we uh, sold these on the uh, North Pole as, as uh, part of the portfolio of a specific balancing uh, responsible party that used this uh, portfolio of uh, residential uh, homes as part of their portfolio to, uh, to, to uh, balance some of the uh, 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 um, generation consumption uh, imbalance. And this was the 24-hour uh, forecast and this is the actual uh, uh, activation of one single house. Uh, what you see uh, here is that we have an override, so the, the, the specific house turns uh, on where it was not intended to. Uh, so, and, 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 and due to that, you, you need a portfolio of, of a number of uh, houses to, to meet the uh, requirements. But as you saw, that, that was uh, uh, in, on the aggregated level, that was quite uh, accurate. 
So uh, I think I'm uh, out of time. I think, but I think we uh, gave a proof of concept that you can use uh, thermal storages uh, in this uh, fashion, uh, and uh, that we are able to uh, achieve uh, scalability. Uh, perhaps I missed one slide that I just wanted to. The very last slide. Uh, uh, we, we did one simulation where we took a, a, a million uh, units uh, that had the different uh, salient uh, properties. Some were extremely flexible and some were rather uh, inflexible. Uh, and uh, on, a, on a standard PC, we were able to, to do the optimization for this uh, portfolio of one million units in uh, three and a half minutes. Uh, and we were able to do a, a, a perfect uh, um, a balancing if we had a decent number of uh, flexible units in the second example here where uh, we had a, a small number of uh, extremely flexible units there was a, a, a small uh, mismatch but we were still able to do the uh, uh, computation in, in three and a half minutes and, and this means that if you have uh, high performance uh, computation to uh, available you can basically do this in in, uh, in real time up to a million uh, units thank you very much Pardon, it, it looks like... You need to know the state of each, each uh, load. Yes, load yep. Um, we, we, we need, we need uh, the overall uh, state of charge for, for every uh, building. What, 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 what we have shown in some other work, however, is that uh, due to the, uh, the uh, on-off nature, it's, uh, it's fairly easy to uh, provide a, a, an estimate that by uh, the central limit theorem is is uh, is guaranteed to give uh, uh, a, 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 a fairly good uh, result, uh, but but this was based on the assumption that we could uh, uh, for for the specific uh, feeder uh, we could we could measure the power, uh, which could be done by uh, smart meters or by uh, feeder level uh, measurements. Uh, as one assumption, but also that we had at least one one measurement for each uh, for each. So so if we have if we had smart meter readings, that would be sufficient to to uh, to have a convergence of the estimator that would uh, provide the state of charge variable. But but basically just one variable.